Hello, and welcome to Free and Clear. I'm John Collins, the founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have Naomi Wright, the founder of Naomi Wright Ministries. And we are asking the difficult questions that people have about religious abuse, breaking them down into simple terms and helping people to become free and clear. Naomi, how are you? I am doing great this morning, John. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. This is this is exciting. This is our second episode, and I feel like we covered a lot of ground in the first. And the topic that we have today, I'm very excited for because it is something that I get a lot of questions about. I bet. Yeah, this was a huge area uh, for me in my transition out of a cult and figuring out what was what. And I mean, hey, the season's upon us to give a hint. So exactly. I think it's timely. Yeah, exactly. So let's get right into it. Um, this is a common question that I get, as I mentioned, um, in our support groups. It comes up from time to time, especially, like you said, around the holidays, the seasons. And specifically, in America at least, it comes very frequently as we approach Halloween. So the topic is holidays, and I'll phrase the question as many of my members of the support groups have mentioned. <clears throat> um, the question is, the religious group that I, was, that I left was strongly against celebrating holidays. We were taught that most of them came from pagan worship. And that by participating, we were giving reference to reverence to pagan gods. After leaving, other Christians invite me to Christian Christmas parties, and I'm uncomfortable. How should I handle this? Oh, I love this question. And all of these questions that you're going to ask me today, John, I mean, I lived it, as I'm sure you lived it too. So this comes from from personal struggle as well. And my first comment that I would want to make to someone asking this question is that if you're uncomfortable going, if you're uncomfortable participating, then there's no need to rush yourself or push yourself into doing something when you're not sure what you think about it yet. And you're not sure how you feel about it. So my first comment would be hold off this year. If you're feeling really unsettled or dip your toe in and check it out a little bit, but don't push yourself to the point where you're really stressed out. If you're stressed out, you're not enjoying it anyway. And so what's even the point. My second comment though, is that I do think it's important to investigate the claim that was made in your cult group. So the claim that's being made in relation to this question is that holidays came from pagan worship. So the question would be, is that true? Did holidays come from pagan practice? And for this specifically, if we're talking about a Christmas party, just to give one example, the answer would be no. And again, you need to go research this as well for yourself. We could certainly put up some links in the show notes to give you some ideas of where to start, but there isn't evidence that the date of Christmas was chosen because it was the same day as a pagan holiday. So it is the same season. It's the same season as several, um, even the same month, but not actually the same date. And that's interesting. That was really interesting for me to find out, John, because I was even taught in ninth grade world history class in public school where, you know, they loved Christmas and it wasn't being practiced necessarily as a, as a religious holiday, but as a secular holiday, I was told that it had been pulled, um, mm -hmm. and taken because of this history of it being, I think I was taught, um, Saturnalia, um, and I'll give some of those examples, uh, later on in our conversation. But, um, so it was really interesting to me doing a bunch of research on this, that again, it's the same season, even the same month, but not actually the same day. There isn't really anything solid to tell us that. Right. Um, and even if I'm going to just hypothesize this for a second, even if it was the same date as a pagan holiday from way back when, and there was some sort of correlation as to why that date was chosen of December 25th, I would want to ask, how does that matter? How does that impact how I would be practicing it today? What my intention is and what it means to us today. So for example, baptism used to be a pagan practice. 
but that's not how Christians use it. And Jesus even said to be baptized, you know, so how do you break right. that down? Right. There's yeah. And there's this historical pagan practice of going out into public and singing songs. So does that mean all choirs need to stop and all concerts with any kind of singing need to stop? Um, what about if we look in um, Latino culture and hanging up pictures of deceased ancestors? Um, that's something that is done for uh, the day of the dead as an example. So does that mean that we shouldn't hang up pictures of our grandparents who have passed away or have a bonfire in the fall because pagans right. used to do all of these things. So if you're going to apply this thinking to Christmas and to Easter and to our specific holidays, then we have to be consistent and carry it all the way through across the board. And that's something that cults are really, really bad about, right? They are very mm -hmm. inconsistent and we don't want to do that anymore. We want to make sure that what we are doing and how we're thinking, we are consistent in our thought process. So I would like to suggest to you that it doesn't even matter if it was used for something else hundreds of years ago. Um, it matters what we're doing right now and our intention matters. Right. <clears throat> for me, you know, I, I'm fascinated with the ancient mythologies. I mm. can't tell you how much time I actually spend going and researching ancient Egypt and Greece and Rome. Um, so I, I grew up very similar. We were taught that it was the sun god worship and that, you know, it's worship of the sun. The other thing that I found about religious cults is that, that while they make these boisterous claims, they very seldom go actually study what it is they're saying. So they're saying a lot of things that just simply aren't true. Like you said, it is a different date. But in my study of, you know, the sun god worship and of the different types of worship of holidays, what I found was that there is some truth to the, um, the claim that it falls into the same date. Because if you think about it, it is a celebration. So I try to break it down logically. When you're referring to the sun god worship, you're worshiping basically the hanging of the sun and the solstices. So you find all of these solstice worship cults, like Stonehenge has the, you know, the rings where you can point to the solstice. Well, there's a reason why these things exist. These were communities of people that lived from the land and the land produced their means to survival. So they have to know the sun. They have to know when is the growing season? When is the, you know, when is the harvest season? And it really became a celebration about harvest in most of, you know, a lot of these holidays, not most. So I grew up in a lot of semi-rural communities with a bunch of good old boys they like to work hard. They like to play hard. They knew when to work and they knew when to play. They had celebrations at harvest and there's different names for these all over the country here where I live now, it's called harvest homecoming, but other cities and States had the pumpkin festivals or, you know, different names that they use for the harvest and everybody got together and they celebrated the harvest and if you really stop and think about it, these are a lot of the people who are joining in these celebrations also have these tainted views of holidays, but yet they're participating in the same type of celebration that they claim created these holidays that they won't participate with. They're doing the same exact thing. And, you know, you have to really think if you're a Christian and you're celebrating with people and it's no matter what the event is, are you actually there to serve another deity? Because that really breaks, that's really what the ultimate question is. Are you, if you celebrate Christmas, are you celebrating the sun god Ra of Egypt? Because that's the claim that they're making, right? Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not going to a Christmas party to serve the sun god Ra. I'm just, I'm just going to be blatantly honest with you. You're not going to sacrifice your children. And that is the problem. These were, these were very horrific ancient deities and ancient mythologies. Yeah. Most people, when they celebrate Christmas, they're cel celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, who is the founder of the Christian religion. They're not serving another deity. So for me, the question is simple. Break it down logically. Who are you going to serve in this holiday? And if the holiday is not a holiday in which you are even thinking about a deity, you're just thinking about, you know, 
uh, President's Day. You're, you're thinking about the presidents. It has actually nothing to do with the deity. It's, it's a holiday. So break it down logically. Think about, think about the reason why you're celebrating. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question, our cult group permitted celebrating of certain holidays, but forbade us from celebrating in the same way that others do. We had Easter parties, for example, but there were no eggs and no bunnies were allowed. Christmas gifts were allowed, but Christmas trees were not. Even collecting candy during Halloween trick-or-treating was allowed, but scary costumes were taboo. The trees, the bunnies, and the costume, costumes with fake blood, they seem and feel anti-Christian, are they? So first of all, I'm upset that some of y'all got to do anything because I didn't get to do anything. (laughs) So I'm like, that's a bunch of garbage right there. (laughs) Right. But So we didn't do anything at all. Um, And I know though, and I've learned more about some of this distinction being made, of course, like you just spoke to John, you know, that, oh, we can do this piece of it, but we can't do that piece of it. And while I understand why some groups would do that, because I know how much groups want to avoid anything that appears cultural and they want to, you know, they are like, we're supposed to be anti-culture and that makes us look too much like the culture around us. And they believe everything about culture is evil. It's bad. And so I can understand why they're making that distinction. It doesn't actually make it accurate. So I'm going to give an example of the Christmas trees and this one it's really unfortunate. And so track with me for a second. I'm going to just run through a few examples and uh, passages in the Bible that are usually used for this. And I'm going to do this as one example. Um, I'm not going to go through bunnies and, and everything, but I want to give you one example. And then you can apply this to anything else you want to investigate. So as an example, Christmas trees, we oftentimes hear several verses in Jeremiah being used. Um, and then we also have a verse in Isaiah. And so I'm going to run through a few of these. Like I said, I'll do it pretty quickly, but we've got Jeremiah two, Jeremiah 10, two through four. And this one we're being told, this is the same as a Christmas tree. We're decorating a tree. We're cutting down a tree. We're decorating a tree. And, and this is bad. This is exactly what they're talking about in Jeremiah. It was prophetic of our culture to come and that we were going to be doing this and we're not supposed to be doing it. It's pagan. This is sinful. Um, in all of these passages, a craftsman is cutting down a tree and he's carving it into an idol. So an actual idol. So in Jeremiah 10, five, they had been carved to look similar to people with mouths and with legs. So that gives us a hint. This isn't just a tree that was cut down and put in someone's house. Like a craftsman took it and then carved it and turned it into an idol. And then we see again in Jeremiah 10, eight and 14, they actually use the word idol. So they're called idols and craftsmen are brought up again. Again, a craftsman, you don't need a craftsman um, to go just chop a tree down. I've actually done that. (laughs) So I can do that. I'm not a craftsman. Um, so it's very different. And in Jeremiah, um, three 13, we see that idols were in this one, idols were placed under trees and they were, that was done because ancient Israel was super hot. (laughs) I mean, it's a desert, it's super hot. So they're under trees. So people could go worship in the shade and hopefully not pass out while they were doing so. This is, um, these are all examples where the, the culture at the time and the demographic and where we are, I mean, all that was super, super important to being able to understand what in the heck were they actually talking about here? And it's a really good example of how wrong we can get it when we don't look at those details and we don't take that seriously. We cause ourselves a lot of stress that we don't necessarily need to have. Um, same in Isaiah 44, 12 through 15, it's the same idea. And for someone who has been told, um, so this idea of kneeling, um, they're kneeling because they're worshiping, they're worshiping an idol. And if we have this idea that we shouldn't be kneeling, um, before something, or if we kneel before something, then we're worshiping it. Then think about that the next time, you know, you're doing a functional activity, like changing a tire on your car, Um, Just because we kneel before something, I mean, I kneel next to my son's bed when I kiss him good, good night, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not worshiping anything. 
So in all of these examples, we're talking about something very, very different than what is going on with using a Christmas tree as a decoration to be festive. And it's not the same if you have to kneel down to place a present or to pick up a present, you're not worshiping it just like you're not worshiping your car and you're not worshiping your young child. So with that idea, I just want to add that Satan can twist and corrupt anything. So that doesn't equate to it meaning the same thing to God and meaning what we want it to mean. So God made trees, he made bunnies, he made pumpkins, and he's incorporating them and we can incorporate them into fun traditions and that can be harmless. Right. Yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that you weren't allowed to celebrate. So there, there are levels of hierarchy within cults. My family was at the very top of the group that your cult splintered from. And we were also not even at the top. The cult leader himself and his inner circle were a level above us. And th- there are two themes that you'll find frequently as I'm talking in these discussions on this show. The first one is break it down logically. Let's think in simple terms. Mm -hmm. The second and foremost really is let's think about the children. How does it affect the children? I will bring this up continually as we go through the show. So the cult leader preached heavily, very harshly against people who had Christmas trees. And that's the reason why your splinter group did not allow Christmas trees. My grandfather on my mother's side also did not allow Christmas trees. My wife was not allowed. My grandfather on my father's side was a little bit torn because he was inside the cult leader's house and stood in front of his Christmas tree. So here's a man whose public persona is preaching against Christmas trees while he himself has one. And again, break it down into logical terms. Why is this? It is all about atmosphere, especially for the children. The the holidays, I I try to break things out into simple terms, but also I want to think slightly outside of the traditional Christian box that that we find ourselves in in America today. Let's use Easter as an example. Easter in Christianity is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, you celebrate Easter. If you're an adult and you celebrate Easter, you understand all of the facts that go with Easter. You understand that Jesus was crucified, and it was a very, very brutal crucifixion. It was a very bloody crucifixion. And all of these images, all of these themes are going through the heads of children if that's only what you focus on. But if you add an Easter bunny, if you add these colored eggs, you're creating an atmosphere that gives them something that they really, really enjoy. And they're associating happy memories with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, rather than having to explain to them, here's this terrible, terrible, painful death and Jesus rose again. There are children of certain ages that you know they will eventually learn this but whenever they're four and five years old this isn't the time you know what i'm you know what i'm saying so associate happy thoughts with their basically their level of maturity and think about how it impacts the children if you take away this pleasant atmosphere yeah and i think it's super important um to (laughs) I don't know what everyone's celebrations of Easter were like, of course, again, we didn't celebrate it at all because we just, we stayed away. We didn't even celebrate birthdays. Like every holiday was out. Um, but Jesus did rise. And so, yes, like you have that morning period and then you go into, okay, we're celebrating. Um, and what does that celebration look like and remembering to celebrate and, for anyone who's interested, I, I, this episode would get way too long, John, if I brought too much of this in right now, but, um, I'm recording on reclamation, um, the Naomi Wright ministries initiative podcast I'm recording, um, by the time this releases, that'll probably be out, but an episode on just theology of celebration, because I think sometimes we see too strongly this anti-celebration it's all doom and gloom. And in reality, that's, that's not what it looks like. Um, we're, we're, they're even commanded in the old Testament to celebrate and to get together and drink wine and eat a lot of food and and enjoy company. And so I want to chat about that 
again at a different time. But I also want to mention that for people who are identifying as Christian and they're celebrating these holidays with Christ in mind, as example, you know, these holidays as in Christmas and Easter, I know we're going to touch on some other holidays. Um, but the problem would come in for a Christian when they want to make it all about those things and the traditions, and then they kind of forget about the Jesus piece of it. So exactly. if your intent So if your intent is to celebrate that Jesus was born, then make that your focus and still have a tree and all these fun things. Mm -hmm. If it's to celebrate his resurrection, then make that your focus and still have these fun things. And we do have an example for this in scripture, which I love in Corinthians, Paul corrects the church in Corinth because they turned the Lord's supper into this gluttonous feast. So they turned it into something it was not intended to be. Paul didn't then tell the church in Corinth not to take communion anymore and not to do the Lord's Supper anymore. He just corrected the focus back onto the meaning and purpose of what they were doing. And that's an excellent model for us. So he didn't say stop having the stop doing all of it. He just said, get your focus right. And so that is something that we can remember as well. Have the focus as what the focus should be and still participate in the fun and the joy and the celebration. Exactly. All right. Next question. I have been out of a cult for a while and I realized that we had very distorted views about holiday celebrations. Even still, I'm uncomfortable. I'm curious what the early Christians thought about it and would they have partied with sun worshipers on the solstices? Would a fourth or fifth century Christian have painted themselves at a festival of color in, in honor of Shiva? How is this different from our holidays today? So John, I already know, having not seen your notes, that you have some stuff that you're excited to share for this question. (laughs) And yeah, you're smiling. Absolutely. Guys, he's ready. (laughs) He's ready. Um, My first question back, my, my, my first response to this is actually a question. And that is how, how does that apply to me now? And if it's a curiosity question, I get it. And I think it's super interesting and I enjoy the historical stuff. But even if fourth and fifth century Christians were doing some of these things, that doesn't mean that I should do these things. And if we're going to be really honest here, Christians have done a lot of horrible things throughout the century that we shouldn't be modeling ourselves after. We shouldn't be replicating it. Um, There's awful things going now, like religious abuse that we're talking about um, that we shouldn't continue or model for future generations. Um, So I'm going to start there. I have some other things to throw out there, but John, you're going to bust. I'm going to let you take it. (laughs) Yeah, so I I am fascinated with the historical questions, obviously, and this is one of the areas that I am just, I I can't stop researching this stuff, right? But I'm going to surprise you a little bit because I'm I'm actually going to focus a little bit on scripture rather than history. Um, Colossians 2.16, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So now I'm going to get into the fun history stuff. Whenever we left the cult that we were in, this was an actual problem for us. We, we had the same views, the same problems that many ex-cult members have about holidays. And the pastor just happened to mention this verse, and I'd never really thought of the verse in this way. But he started describing to us the ancient cults, the ancient religions, and what they worshipped and how they worshipped. And that's where I first heard that these ancient religions, ancient cults, were worshipping deities that were based on natural phenomenon. You know, the moon cycles, the sun cycles, and specifically uh, the new moons. And it was very... It's very difficult to wrap my head around. The ancient Jews also had festivals that were the moons, which is kind of what Paul is referring here to, but not specifically. The problem was these were in these Colossians were struggling because there were people who had came out of these cults, these pagan religions, and they were worshiping the moon cycles for their pagan religion. And the early Christians were wanting to also worship and celebrate the festivals for 
purposes of Christianity, not pur purposes of the ancient deities. They were not worshiping the ancient deities. But this very ascetic group of Christians were trying to tell them, you can't worship, you can't celebrate on these new moons because you're giving honor to these ancient pagan deities. And Paul steps in and says specifically, don't let anyone try to take away your joy. So really, you have the same exact thing happening today that's mentioned in that scripture. You have two different groups of Christians, one who are telling the other, don't, worship, don't celebrate these holidays because it just happens to fall on the day of an ancient deity, a pagan religion. And you've got another group of Christians who are saying, but we're not worshiping this deity. We're, we're either just simply celebrating or we're worshiping Jesus Christ on Christmas. So it really comes down to that question. Is your intent to participate in these holidays to worship another deity? Yeah. And again, if you identify as Christian, where is your worship? And just like you said, John, that's, that's the difference is you're not if you are worshiping those things, that's a different conversation. Be aware of that. I don't know of anyone who's worshiping their Christmas tree. I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> so again, and I mean, we say that kind of lighthearted and I know that this is a really serious issue and it causes a lot of stress for people, but sometimes once you get more into the research of it and you start to investigate it more, you can see that, gosh, like that's, it's, it's almost silly you know, it's kind of actually silly what we were mm -hmm. told. There's really no foundation for that. Right. So let's go to the next question. <clears throat> As children grew up, growing up in the cult, we were not allowed to join the other neighborhood children in trick-or-treating or Halloween. We were told that evil spirits were out and Halloween specifically was inviting these spirits into our hearts and homes. I'm told that in our new church, God protects us and we need not be afraid, but it's still hard to overcome that fear when I see witches and goblins and zombies. Do other Christians not feel these evil spirits? Okay, so this one's got some nuances to it that I'm going to break down um, again from a Christian worldview. So I'm going to split this up a little bit. John, feel free to jump in somewhere if you want to. Um, to start, I want to talk a little bit about the history of Halloween because ultimately in the United States, and I want to emphasize that because I know we have listeners in other countries. And so if it looks different, if there's something similar in your country and it looks different, of course, take that into account. But I'm speaking to what it looks like in the U.S. It's very much a melting pot. So we have no good evidence that Halloween is even pagan, though if it were, again, my previous response, I'd apply it to Halloween. Um, if you're not practicing it in that way, and this is what someone did thousands of years ago, I mean, stop singing in your choir as well, you know? So, um, there's no evidence that it's even pagan, but we have some things that are from European Christian roots. We've got all saints day or all hollows hollows day, which was, um, or which is November 1st. And that's to honor the deceased saints. And it had been May 13th. So it was moved to no November 1st. Um, that was around AD 610, Pope Boniface IV decided to do that. And then the evening before was also sanctified as All Hallows' Eve or Halloween. And that was a time to remember the faithful believers of past ages and to pray that the living might learn from their good example. Um, I hadn't known that. And when I started researching it, I thought that was pretty cool. And then All Souls' Day November 2nd, this is more of a Catholic practice, but praying for the dead in purgatory. So that's what All Souls Day was for. We have some history for All Hallows Eve. So Halloween of Irish peasants back in the day, they'd bang pots and ring bells for those trapped in hell so they wouldn't cause problems on earth. Um, in England, there's gay, uh, Guy Fox Day on November 5th. And that was um, based on a, a guy who was part of a Catholic plot that attempted to blow up parliament. And it became a day to harass Catholics, demand beer and cakes from them, have bonfires, cause mischief. And British colonists um, brought these over to the U.S. as well. So we kind of have like this whole mix of there's a lot of different holidays and celebrations going around at that time with these kind of similar themes, but still different and having different focus for each one. And then in the U S um, teenagers started putting on masks, 
playing pranks and damaging property. And in 1933, it got so out of hand um, that it began to morph, that culture began to morph Halloween into what we see it today with parties, games, costumes, contests. Um, and the goal was to actually divert youth from creating wreaking havoc on the town. So it was, okay, we need to get them off the streets guys, because they're causing a lot of problems. We can't control that. And so we're going to bribe them with candy. So they don't, (laughs) um, they don't come and do prank, commit pranks and stuff and commit probably what would be major misdemeanors now. So, and then of course, I mean, hello, we're, we're in America, people like money and companies saw the opportunity for profit. So we're talking less than a hundred years ago, companies jump on this and are like, we can make good money selling costumes and Halloween candy and all this stuff. And so then it became more of a commercial thing. Now with that, that's how most of us are practicing it. Um, now some do, some do celebrate Halloween as a day to connect with the dead in various ways. In some belief systems, Halloween is a holy day for them. And they are doing some things that many of us would find disturbing. Like there are groups that do drink animal blood, like these things do exist. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some people are making Halloween special in an evil spirit kind of creepy way and bringing that to it. But that doesn't mean in the end that we need to prevent our kids from dressing up like princesses and Paw Patrol characters to get candy from their neighbor. Again, it's the same idea we've already talked about, right? Like, well, what are we doing and how are we doing it? So that's my initial response. I'm going to pause there, John, if you want to jump in before I go (laughs) into my second rant. (laughs) I I actually see this as an extension of our last episode, believe it or not. Mm. This isn't so much a a Halloween or a holiday question. This is really a cult question. This is about the indoctrination of a cult per, of a cult member. And interestingly, as this question has came up in our support groups, there are varying stages of which this question gets asked and the way in which it is asked. People who first come out of a cult ask this question much differently than a person who's in the process of deprogramming. And the question is even asked differently still from people who have been, you know, through the process of, of deconstructing what was in their head and are still in, you know, still in support. This is a question about black or white, good versus evil. This is, for me, this question is about what the cult leader did to their minds. In, in a religious cult, in any destructive cult, the leaders paint themselves to be the heroes. And specifically in religious cults, they create this fantasy world that is very black or white, good or evil, angels or demons, and they make it extremely scary so that the people who are under their control can look to them as the hero for this world that they have created. Now, I'm not saying that to say that angels and demons don't exist or, you know, they're found in the Bible. What I'm saying is that they overemphasize it to the extent that anything that bad, anything bad that happens to you it's a demon. Anything good that happens to you, it's either the cult leader, an angel, or something versus, you know, uh, normal life. I, I was with a person who um, was trying very hard to get a parking space one time, and the devil was stopping them from getting the parking space. And they're going around and around the parking garage, and they prayed, oh, Lord, give me the parking space. And this is no joke. I, to this day, I feel mortified that this happened, but I watched them cut off a handicapped person to grab the first spot nearest to the door. Oh. And they, they prayed, Oh, thank you, Jesus. I got this parking space. I prayed and you mm-hmm. got it. And I'm over here looking at the person with a handicap sticker on their part on their car. And I'm thinking this wasn't God. This wasn't a demon stopping them from getting the parking space. This is, this is them being in this world, this fantasy world of angels and demons that doesn't really even exist to the level in which they think it did. And so because cult leaders have taught these people that they're the hero who comes to save them, it's actually creating a different religion, not even Christianity. 
-hmm. It's more of, it's a Harry Potter religion, right? It's, (laughs) it's not even something that physically exists in the way in which they present it. Perfect love has no fear. So the way that I address this question, when people bring it up in our support groups is that we were, while we were trained to fear, we were trained to fear because of manipulation, because of the cult leader wanting to control us. When you escape that, it's very difficult to shake that fear, especially when you first escape, you're still going to fight. You're going to struggle with that no matter what it's coming out in the holidays because you see these evil spirits, you see, you associate it with these horror movies, right? I, when we left the cult, I had, I had never watched really sat down and watched a horror movie for years after I left, because I still felt like these demons were coming to me through the TV. And, you know, after I, I I think it's ridiculous what, what was in my head because it's fake blood. It's even the scenes look fake now that I, am escaped, but this was very, very real to me at that time. And I remember the stages of, of processing this, even after I felt like I, you know, I felt like I was out of the cult and out of the cult mindset, I still was living in this angels versus demons world. And it's just simply not to the level in which we were taught. Yeah. And I think that that example with the parking spot is a great way to bring light to that because first of all, is that how Jesus would have wanted that driver to respond is to snag that spot just to make their prayer be answered. You know, it's like, no, we're just trying to make something be something that it's actually not. And yeah, it's taken way too far and it creates, gosh, I mean, I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of everything. Everything was demonic. Everything was, a potential trap of some kind. And I was, I was going to miss the trap and step right into it. And it was so crippling of a fear. And when we're talking about holidays specifically, the more I've learned about them, the more freedom I've had to actually celebrate God, to celebrate Jesus, to celebrate, you know, what's been done for me. And I didn't have that before. And I really appreciate what you said about like, you don't have to be afraid and we are told not to be afraid. And I love Psalm 118, 24 that says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So good is triumphed over evil. We don't have to be afraid. And if you're going to be afraid of Halloween, then you would have to be afraid of every day. Because if, if there are evil spirits out there, which I believe there are, then they're going to be present every day on some level, not just on Halloween, Um, one last comment I wanted to make as far as dressing up like something, um, maybe that's considered evil or dark. So John, I know that was a part of the question you had asked me. And if you're thinking like, oh my, I want to dress up like a devil or an ax murderer or something like that. I just want to put out there. I'm not saying that I think I'm not going to assert that. I think that is sinful. That's not a statement I'm going to make. I would ask what is the purpose for wanting to dress up that way? And that's just a question I would have. So if, if those, those dark things, like a devil or dressing up like a demon or someone who's like murdered a lot of people, um, if you're wanting to dress up like something, I would suggest that those sorts of costumes and, and stepping into that character in some way, those things do represent rebellion against God. They represent what Jesus came to overcome. And so I would just wonder what that that's about. I would just wonder, okay, why would you want to do that? Now I'm not condemning you for it. I don't think that you're not saved because of it, but I would just wonder what is the motivator for that? And I'd be curious to, to dialogue about it a bit. Yeah. I, um, so I'm a musician and there's all kinds of music and music tells stories. Whenever I was in, in the cult, we were only allowed very sacred, not even worship music. We were only allowed this old 1950s Christian music. Right. Mm -hmm. And, I'm a musician. So it was, it was as though I was being told I could, I was a painter and I could only paint with the color green. I had to, had to to create music within this box. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came out of this box, it was as much of a shell shock as the people who asked this question, 
because there's all kinds of music out there. There's good music. There's bad music. There's music that I at that time felt was evil. There's music that's talking about evil things. And I started thinking about it in terms of reading books. I'm fascinated with all kinds of reading. I, when I was, I was a kid, I used to bring home two grocery bags full of books and read them every week from the library, every single week. I had no problem reading a murder mystery. I had no problem reading a wholehearted, good Louis L'Amour Western. I liked, I liked all kinds of variety. I, I actually like books that were about thieves who brilliantly broke and created a, a bank heist. I loved it. It's not that I would break into a bank and steal from the bank, but it's a story. It tells a story about a person who does, and it's a fascinating story. Now apply that to music. I came out of the cult. I started listening to music and some of the groups that I listened to, I decided that I wasn't going to dislike a group because they had a song I disliked because they also had songs that I did like. So I started listening to different groups and broadened my horizons ex- extremely. And then this group came on singing the song about a highway to hell. And I, I actually, it was funny because in the church we were at, at the time, I had just heard that song and it actually came up in a sermon like the, the very next week. And I had not spoken to the pastor. He just suddenly, you know, thought about the highway to hell song and this was a person who enjoyed the song, but he used it philosophically. And that, that surprised me. Here's a pastor who's talking about the highway to hell whenever I was abhorred that this song even exists. But when I took a step back about it, I started thinking, now think about movies. You've got movies who are also very like, you know, the movies are very much like books. They're telling stories. I enjoy watching. I, I can't even remember the name of it. The story where um, Ocean's Eleven is a good example, where the guys are planning this massive theft. Right? I enjoy it. I'm not a thief. Mm-hmm. Or the person who is. It's a movie about a person who's going through some really hard times, overcomes, and it's a success story. Well, during the dark, morbid times when they're struggling. There's music in the background that is dark, morbid songs. And without them, you couldn't even portray the movie theme that's being played. So I, can, I could suddenly start to envision the song Highway to Hell for a person who's going through some hard times because that's what they're experiencing. And truly, they're probably on the highway to hell during that time. And I started thinking about it differently. It's, it's a story. It's not that I... I'm suggesting people should go to the highway to hell if I do listen to the song. I don't particularly like the song, but I also don't look at it in the same way that I did. I also overcame my fear of horror movies and thoroughly enjoyed watching The Walking Dead, which is zombies. And here in Louisville, Kentucky, they have the zombie walk. And my neighbors showed me pictures. I'm actually planning on going to this thing sometime. You dress up like a zombie, you walk, and everybody is dressed like a zombie, and it's a celebration. It's not that they're worshiping blood and gore and end of the world. They're having fun with it. And, you know, even the show itself, I'm not going to say it's the best show that I've watched, but it's it was a lot of fun because you're scared out of your mind that somebody <laughs> that somebody you like in the show is going to get scratched by a zombie and then turn into one. So it, it can be fun. Um, the other thing going back to the music that I'll say that does relate is I also am very emotional. I also came through some very severe mental health issues. I went through some extremely dark times and during those times, happy music doesn't work. You okay. cannot be suffering, especially with mental health, mm-hmm. and enjoy happy. It actually pushes, pushes you further into your mental health issues. I had friends who were also suffering. I could identify with other people who were, and I could pick them out of a crowd. And usually the ones who are suffering the most were listening to very dark music. And Nirvana, I don't like Nirvana. It's a lot of the music. I don't even know what 
genre it is, but there's a lot of music even about suicide. Mm-hmm. I never made it that far. I was, I had a cousin who thankfully talked me through it, but I have um, friends who were suicidal and they loved Nirvana because it was a way of venting their emotion. And quite frankly, I think in some ways it might have prevented their suicide because it was an outlet. Mm-hmm. So whenever I think about Halloween and I think about all of these things that they're dressing up, I don't look at it in the same way. I look at it as fun. If I want to be Dracula, I'm going to have the teeth. I'm going to have the blood. And I, I I'll probably watch the Dracula movie before I go walk as walk with my kids. Right. It, it's a fun thing. It's not something that is intended to be in any way, shape or form related to worship. Yeah. And gosh, you said so many good things in there. I want to comment on a couple. First of all, when I'm thinking about people dressing up like, like not Dracula, not a zombie, I'm going to give you an example. So there is this house on our block where it's like, it's creepier than I can handle. Okay. Like it's, and there's just, there's stuff going on there on a day-to-day basis, but on Halloween, they like really embrace like as, as dark and creepy as they can get it. And it's just beyond my comfort zone. Like it's not. And I also know more about this family to know that, um, based on their spiritual beliefs and how they identify, like they, they are making it as a holy day. So I know enough to know that that is accurate. Um, And so that's a house I don't want to take my three-year-old to, to trick or treat because he's going to, he's just, he's going to have nightmares. He's going to like, that's not, it's not fun for him. It's not fun for me. And so why would I do that? Um, And so there is a difference, like I said, in how John's talking about celebrating it and I'm talking about celebrating it and how there is a population of people that do celebrate it differently And that's not a house I want to go to a Halloween party at, you know, that's not a decision I would make to me, that would be foolish and I wouldn't have a good time. So if the point is for it to be fun, make sure it is fun for you. Um, The other thing I wanted to comment on is as far as, you know, the horror films and all that stuff, it really can depend on how sensitive, I I don't know, there might be a better word to use you guys, but I'm thinking of like a level of sensitivity to those things where it's like, I don't like things that look weird. Right. That's me. My husband loves it. It doesn't bother him at all. He thinks it's great. And I'm like, good for you. Grab a buddy, go see that movie. I'm staying home. I'm going to watch a romantic comedy. Give me the rom-com. I'm going to be fine. Now I do love suspense. Um, I love legal books where there's, um, I can't think of an author right now, but Oh, like Lisa Scott where it's these, um, or like, someone was murdered and there's this mystery around it and they're trying to figure it out. I love like that legal part and that detective stuff. And I love all that stuff. Um, so like, I'm good with that, but I'm not good with like super creepy looking images, you know, like that, right. they just pop back up in my brain. It's just how my brain works. Like I will see it later. Um, and so I know that about myself. And so I make decisions in accordance with that, because again, why would I do that if it's not enjoyable and it's not fun for me? Yeah. And I, I share that the same to some extent. I'm actually not a fan of horror movies. I'm, <clears throat> for me, I like adventure and I like especially historical movies. Um, Walking Dead is unusual because it's more of an adventure than it is a zombie horror uh, movie. It's, it's, it, it's just totally different. There are horror movies that I can't watch. I will wake up for m- months after this <laughs> when the vision's popping in my head. It's just mm-hmm. not me. I prefer sci-fi, but something you said um, brings back to my two main points. It's all about the children. Put yourself in the mind of a child. Your child going to the scary house is wrong because it would affect the child. This, This is a celebration for the child. And a lot of times we lose focus of, of how it impacts the children and not just with the Halloween, the house is scaring them, but taking the celebration away from them impacts the children. And anything you do, you have to put yourself into the mind of the child that you're with and how does it affect them? Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. And for me growing up, everything was, everything was scary. Right. I was afraid of everything. And so how did that impact me? I mean, horribly, it had a huge impact and it was a lot that I had to heal from. Right. And no, I don't want that for my child. Absolutely not. All right. So the next question I'm going to give you is a curveball. This is, believe it or not, this is a real question that came from, from actually a few different people. Um, I work with support groups all over the world, but in the United States specifically, this is a question that actually comes up in the South, in the Southern regions of the United States. And there are different holidays that is the similar question, but I'm going to use this one specifically. Number one, because it's interesting to me, but number two is I want to see how you are, how you react with a curveball. The religious cult we escaped was strongly against Martin Luther King Jr. Day. As a black family, this was really odd. Why would a religious cult even care about a national holiday? So, John, I'm curious to see what your response is to this as well. But this, I can answer this in very few words. And then I'm going to give a little more uh, detail. But uh, because they're racist, that's my answer. That's the only reason. I mean, are they against President's Day? Do they have a problem with all presidents? Are they against Labor Day? Do they have a problem with laborers? Like, what on earth could that be about other than racism? So that's my response. Um, Taking that back to a Christian worldview, God is not racist, but people certainly can be, and they certainly have been throughout history and even today. God is so obviously for racial and ethnic diversity and equality. He stated way back in Genesis chapter one, that he created all humankind in his image, not just certain skin colors in Genesis chapter 12. God said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your household. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples. In Revelation chapter 7, 9. So we're getting, you know, we're at the end of the book now. (laughs) Revelation chapter 7, 9. I love this one, you guys. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the lamb is Jesus. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They were wearing white robes. So we have people from every nation, tribe, language, all different. And they're all still in white robes. They're all equal. They're all equal before God. And so there is absolutely, and there are things in scripture. This might be a good episode to do actually, John later, there are things in scripture that make people believe that slavery and things like that were actually biblical. That is not true. That is poor exegesis. And that is not what was being preached back then. So yeah, my straight up answer is they're racist. (laughs) And and you're, you're actually right, but this is deeper (laughs) than this. (laughs) Um, So if you've seen my website and you've read my books, you might think that this question is just simply promotion of my website and my books, because there's a there's definitely a theme on my website about white supremacy and the cult, how it progressed through white supremacy and how it actually was created by members of the Ku Klux Klan. So you might hear this question. You think that I'm promoting the book, but believe it or not, this was a question that was asked before I even knew any of that existed back before my website was even named William Branham historical research before I had even an inkling of thought that there was potentially racism in the cult that we escaped. This question came up from people in the South and the support groups. And I, I actually just set it on the shelf. I didn't think about it for years. Um, It, it wasn't really until you gave me the list of questions that it even came back to my memory that this, this was a real thing. This was really bothering this person who asked this and, and not just one person. It came up from a couple of people. Um, it, for me, this is about agenda. I also, so this is a question that comes up in the South and the South and the, and the United States is well known for having roots in racism and still some lingering issues there. But I've also heard it about other holidays that are non- non-religious holidays, just celebrations. And it really comes down to the cult's agenda 
against whatever is the motivation for the holiday. So in this particular case, obviously it's racism. They're against Martin Luther King Day. We escaped the cult following of William Branham, and William Branham said that Martin Luther King Jr. was communistic inspired, whatever that means. <clears throat> it was a common theme in the white supremacy groups. They were trying to use a background of communism to persuade people that, that this integration of blacks and whites in the school system was a result of communism. So there was some racial themes and it was very white, supr white supremacistic. Um, there, there's a lot of history behind it and you can find it on my website if you're interested in that history. But for me, the question isn't so much about racism, black or white, Martin Luther King. This is about an agenda. And if you were in a group that practiced religious abuse, the only theme that is common among all cults that practice religious abuse is that they have an agenda. And that agenda changes, and it's always a destructive agenda. So this is about a destructive agenda against a civil rights leader for the purposes of white supremacy, for racism. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether it's Martin Luther King or President's Day or any of the other holidays, if that person is speaking harshly against something that doesn't make sense from a moral standpoint, it's good to take a step back and examine why is, why is this person saying it? What is their motivation behind saying it? Because usually if you find their motivation, you found their agenda. And if you found their agenda, you can untangle the mess that was created in your head through indoctrination. Yeah. Oh, I love that you bring that up. And it made me think of, I said, President's Day kind of flippantly, but President's Day was an issue in our household because we were against government, I, I all forms of President, government. I think President's Day was actually the other one that came up in mm -hmm. the support groups. I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Um, and so we were just supposed to have nothing to do with government. So, I mean, school was still closed, so we still had off, but it wasn't something that had any intentionality to it. And I don't know culturally how much intentionality it has these days anyway, I guess. Right. Maybe it does in some households more than others. But for us, yeah, it was government's bad. It's right. polluted was actually the word that, that I was told. So, and yeah, it is polluted. I mean, that's mm -hmm. true, but not in a way where I have to be afraid of it and I shouldn't have any participation in it. You know, it's a different, different way of how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and not everybody is as bad as everybody else. So it was right. just throw the whole thing out, have nothing to do with it. And if you do again, and this is a huge part of it, right, John, at the end of the day, if you did have a part of it, you had sinned. There was no room for just a difference of opinion or a difference of practice. It was like, you do what you're told to do. You follow this to the T or your salvation is at stake. You might not even actually be a, a true, true follower. Right. The other thing I'll mention is that this is also a struggle that I've seen among a lot of escapees. There is a deep tendency to dive deeper into conspiracy theories and this, this is a problem, especially in today's world when the media is generating conspiracy theories, because now it is actually empowering these types of destructive groups to use this fear and use these agendas. And they're actually, you know, I've, I've actually sat in churches where they were bringing newspapers and saying, look, I'm right. See, this is the thing. This is, this is the conspiracy. It's prophecy fulfilled. Well, it still comes back down to the agenda. You have to look through all of the mess of conspiracy theories and look, what is the motivation behind what they're saying? Is that motivation something that I can agree with? And I break it down again to simple terms. For me, it's, it's all about, there, there are two commandments in the Bible that are the greatest of all. Love your neighbor as yourself and love God. And can that can this type of agenda be filtered through that filter can you truly say that you're honoring those two commandments by this yeah yeah that's excellent 
So last question, what advice would you give a former cult member who is still under bondage of fear during certain holidays? I mentioned this a little bit, I think back um, towards the end of the first question, but I'm, I want to elaborate on it a little bit. So first start doing your research, start checking things out. It's super important. It's going to take some time. So pick the next holiday coming up that you want to know about and get started Two, again, don't rush yourself into participating in activities that you don't believe are okay as of now, or you just don't feel good about. Don't push yourself into doing something again, if it's not enjoyable to be participating because you feel spiritually stressed out, then that's really not a whole lot better than participating and, or the not participating and feeling left out. So you want to go at your own pace so that it is actually enjoyable for you. And when you combine these two things, you combine your research and participate as you go, hopefully you'll start to find that more and more is actually okay. And again, even good and fun. And then the holidays become a time where you're more excited and you get to enjoy that time with family and friends and and others. Right. There's also a personality aspect. There are certain holidays that certain people, they just really don't care to celebrate and they find comfort in, in the fact that they weren't allowed to celebrate it because they really don't care. And why push yourself? So if it's not a holiday that you even want to celebrate, but if it is one that you are, I always go back to Colossians two 16. Don't let anyone pass judgment on you for a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath it is specifically talking about holidays. And if you're approaching this from a biblical standpoint, that is the verse that empowers you. If you're approaching this from a logical standpoint, what is causing the fear and how do you untangle the fear? And again, that question goes back to our last episode. Knowledge overcomes a lot of problems. Fear is one of them. The more you understand what it is you're dealing with, the more you know the history, the more you know the scripture, if you're a Christian, the more knowledge you have in understanding the reasons behind the way that you think, the easier it is to adjust the way that you think. Yeah. And I, this makes me think of um, Romans 14 as well, where we're told that if you feel like something would be you sinning, if you feel like it's wrong, then don't do it. Because if you did do it, even if God doesn't think it's wrong, you did it even though you thought it was wrong. So that conscience piece comes into play. So, but that's different than it actually being wrong. And what's so important about that is, first of all, you could change your mind on where you stand. You could change your position and be like, you know what? I looked into it more. I know it's no longer think it's wrong. Okay, great. Go ahead. It's also a caution to how you're categorizing what other people are doing. So just because you think it's wrong. And so you're not going to do it right now. Doesn't mean the other person who thinks it's okay is wrong because they are doing it. Right. This has been incredibly fun. This, This is one of my favorite topics. And I'm even more excited for what's coming in our next episode. Uh, thank you for, the, for answering the questions with us, Naomi, and I look forward to the next one. If you have questions that you'd like to hear answered on our show, please send them to us. You can contact us on the contact page of freeandclearshow.com, and we'd be glad to hear from you. We want to help you become free and clear. Free and clear.